Those circumstances that caused this difficult relationship, one of which was the prophecy that Elijah gave. Um, another problem was simply this, is that, that uh, Ahab was a worshiper of Baal. And Elijah was a worshiper of Jehovah. So this immediately caused this problem and this difficulty between the two. Ahab was the son of Omri, who was uh, the sixth king of Israel. And the scripture says that Ahab wrought evil and Omri, his father, wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. This was not a good spiritual condition that, that, that Elijah found himself in. Now, adding to this is what we uh, would commonly talk about, and that is that Ahab was married to a Phoenician woman named Jezebel. It just doesn't, doesn't even taste good to say it. He was married to Jezebel, who was raised to serve false gods, the false god of Baal and Asherah. Her father's name was Ethbaal, the king of the Zidonians. He was a notorious, idolatrous leader. He was a notorious, idolatrous man in his own right. You see, Jezebel was an unabashed idolater who served Baal, the principal goddess of the Phoenicians. She not only served these false gods, but as queen of Israel, she kept prophets to this small g God. She had 400 prophets of the groves, scripture says, and that was the, uh, the prophets of Ashtart. Together they made a powerful and ungodly leadership team. Elijah was a stranger. He was from Gilead. So he was kind of a guy that came in from the outside. So he had all of these strikes against him before he ever got started. As far as Ahab was concerned, Elijah was a loose cannon that he couldn't get his hands on. He couldn't figure out how to tame him and how to control him. Since Solomon's death 58 years earlier, seven wicked kings had reigned and Ahab was following in the actions of his predecessors. And it was in this condition that God sent Elijah to tell King Ahab, there will be no rain until I say so. It seems, it seems like a simple statement at its, on its face. But the longer the time went, the more challenging this became. The longer the days went, the more Ahab became desperate. There was no rain. It got to where there was no rain, so there was no vegetation that was growing. In fact, at one point, he sent Obadiah, not the one, not the minor prophet, it's a different Obadiah. But he sent him out to look for vegetation so they could somehow keep their uh, animals alive. And it was at this moment that uh, Obadiah bumped into Elijah. And they start conversing. And, and the conversation, I won't get into all of the conversation, but uh, uh, he said, you're in trouble, man. You're causing big problems. And Ahab is after you. He wants to destroy you. Scripture says that as the time went on, it got so desperate that Ahab and Jezebel were searching everywhere for Elijah. In fact, uh, 1 Kings 18 and 10 says that there was no nation or kingdom where, this is what Obadiah said, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. You see, the situation was getting really desperate and Ahab was like, I got to find this guy and I got to tell him to knock it off. I got to tell him to stop this because we're all going to uh, die if he doesn't call for rain. 
It's likely that Ahab and Jezebel searched for Elijah between uh, uh, one and a half and maybe two and a half years, searching for him, trying their best to find this man. It was, it was, it was dry. It was drought everywhere. Everybody was dying. But the man of God was thriving because God called him to the brook Kireth. And it was there at the brook Kireth that uh, uh, he commanded the ravens to come and feed him. And he drank from the brook. Amen. That was the first, first uh, Grubhub or Uber Eats or I don't know. The ravens brought him his food. Until the brook dried up. And when the brook dried up, now the man of God is on the run again. I don't know about you, but in my opinion, I would have thought, God, you're going to send him so far away that Jezebel will never find him. Surely, God, you're going to take him. He was already he was already uh, far away from uh, uh, from from where he thought they would find him. But now the Lord spoke to him, the scripture says, and the Lord commanded him to go to Zarephath. The Lord commanded him to go to Zarephath. Now, I'm not sure what that means to you, but let me tell you what it means to me. Zarephath was a, a particular city that was located in uh, Phoenicia. It was right on the Mediterranean Sea. It was right between Sidon to the north and Tyre to the south. Now, the reason why this is significant, in my opinion, is because verse 31 of chapter 16, 1 Kings 16, 31, the latter part of that verse says that the son of Nebat that took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zidonians. What I'm telling you is, uh, Zidon was the, the was the uh, jurisdiction of Jezebel's father, and instead of God taking him and putting him so far away, He put him, if I could say it this way, right under the nose of Jezebel. In order for Jezebel to get to Sidon, wherever her father lived, she likely had to go right through Zarephath. She likely had been there many times in her life. Likely she had even been there when Elijah was there. What I'm telling you is God had a revival in the most unlikely place. He put a man of God in a place where Jezebel likely could have found him. Her father could have found him. But in the middle of that place, God said, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm going to give a revival in Zarephath. Don't you tell me we can't build churches in Oklahoma. Don't you tell me we can't have revival in Oklahoma. Don't you tell me that God's got to hide us out somewhere. He can give us for revival. We can build churches all over Oklahoma. If God could hide the man of God. And he didn't just hide him. He thrived. He thrived. Hallelujah. He had a great revival. Right under the nose. You say, I'm telling you, the world's getting bad. Things are going down. Everything's terrible. Nobody wants it. Can I just tell you, God can build your church right under the nose of the devil. He can build your church right in the most difficult and challenging place in all. Listen, there's no hard cases for God. You hear me? There's no hard cases for God. Right downtown Oklahoma City, a stone's throw from the Capitol, uh, there's a thriving church. Planned Parenthood on one side, and who knows what's on the other side. God can build a church anywhere.
anywhere. He can build a church in a small town. He can build a church in a big town. He can build a church full of yuppies. He can build a church full of hicks. He can build a church anywhere. There can be revival in Zarephath. You hear me? There can be revival in Zarephath. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Listen to what the scripture says. And I, I know we I know we quote this verse often, but I just want you to stop and think about it for a moment. Romans 5 and 20. Romans 5 and 20. Moreover, the law entered uh, that the offense uh, might abound. The law came to tell everybody they were wrong. They were sinners. Uh, it came to tell them they were missing the mark. Uh, and and it, just, it seemingly uh, would make things worse. Uh, but the writer Paul went on to say, but where sin uh, abounded, uh, grace uh, did much more abound. Uh, you see, uh, the law is not the end of the story. The law that tells you you're wrong is not the end of the story. Where sin was abounding, grace was super abundantly overperforming. Where sin abounded, grace does much more. Abound. It was abounding over and above. The scripture says over, the Greek is over and above. Super abounding. Praise God. I mean, I know people say today, you know, nobody wants this. And nobody's interested and people are too carnal and people are too set in their ways and whatever. But could I just tell somebody, could I tell a pastor here tonight? There is no such thing as a burnt over field in God's economy. There is no such thing as some place that's too hard in God's economy. There's no school that's too difficult uh, to have a P7 club in it. Uh, there is no workplace uh, that's too difficult to have a revival in it. Uh, there is no city. Uh, there is no suburb. Uh, there is no big town. Uh, there is no little town. Uh, there is no place that's too difficult uh, for God to put his kingdom in. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, you can have revival in Zarephath. Uh, we can have revival in Zarephath. Hallelujah. Uh, praise God. Now let me tell you where Zarephath is. I told you just a moment ago. But I want to remind you. Because the next few points I want to make are going to be contingent upon this fact that you understand. If you look at a map, Zarephath is, uh, if you look at a map, Sidon is in the north. Just a few miles below Sidon is Zarephath. And just a few miles below Zarephath is uh, Tyre. And so when I'm talking about Zarephath, you have to understand, I'm talking about right in the middle, right between Tyre and Sidon. And so having said that, you have to realize that Jesus said a lot of stuff about Tyre and Sidon. So let's think about what he said about Tyre and Sidon. Let me read to you from the book of Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke chapter 10. I'll begin with the first two verses because this is the foundation of this. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them to sent them two by two before his face to every city and place, whether he himself would come. Therefore, he said unto them, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his Harvest. Could I just stop right here and tell somebody, it's not your harvest, it's his harvest. It's not your harvest, it's his harvest. He's got more invested than we do. It's his harvest. It's his, he's going to do it. Let's, let's, let's partner with him. And listen to what, listen to what Jesus said in verse number 13. He, he's kind of talking bad about uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida. And I know we oftentimes focus on those two. Because he said, woe unto thee Chorazin, woe unto thee Bethsaida. And then he draws this contrast between Bethsaida and Chorazin and Tyre and Sidon. And he says, for if the mighty works that were done 
if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have, they would have, if, if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. What he was saying is, uh, he was saying Tyre and Sidon is not out of bounds. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, although they may be heathens, uh, they may be outside of the borders of Israel, uh, they may be uh, heathenistic nations. Uh, if you would have just gone and preached to them, uh, they would have repented a long time ago uh, in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, come on, somebody, uh, just preach it. Uh, just believe it. Uh, just talk to people about it. Uh, just tell them about uh, and show them the miraculous power of God. Because if you do, uh, they'll repent uh, in sackcloth and ashes. Don't qualify the harvest. Uh, don't make it act like it's too hard. Uh, the more desperate people are, uh, the easier it will be for them to turn to Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. They would have repented a long time ago in sackcloth and ashes. Sometimes we say, well, we couldn't have, and there's no way that person's ever going to come. There's no way that neighborhood will ever give in. No way we could ever have a church in that town. Wrong, wrong, wrong. When you start preaching to them, they'll repent in sackcloth and ashes a long time ago. Praise God. Praise God. Scripture says, another time Tyre and Sidon is mentioned. Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 21. Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan was there. He came into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And there was a woman there that was so unlikely. To step in to what we have, what she needed. In fact, the disciples, could, could I just be your friend here? The disciples said, she's crying after us. Send her away. Get rid of this woman. She's messing up our image. She's messing up our... Uh, she's messing up. We got to get rid of her. And Jesus looked at her and said, I'm not sent with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This was an unlikely candidate. In the borders of Tyre and Sidon. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Even the dogs get the crumbs. Just give me a crumb and I'll, I'll be happy. And Jesus looked at her and he said, O oh woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Don't put Tyre and Sidon or Zarephath out of the equation. Keep it in the equation because Jesus loves to walk in unlikely places and give revival in unlikely circumstances. He loves to walk into places that everybody else said can't have revival and he likes to give a revival he likes to use people that nobody expects to be used and he likes to give them revival I'm telling you God can give revival in Seraphat praise God praise God let me just let me just share a couple of things about a Zarephath revival Elijah shows up because the Lord sent him there, okay? It wasn't just an accident. He didn't just happen to get there. The Lord sent him to Zarephath. And as the Lord sent him to Zarephath, he walks into the gates of the city. And he sees a widow woman that is gathering a few sticks because she's going to make a meal for her and her son. And then she's going to die. At her own admission, I'm going to make the last meal. We're going to eat it. And then we're going to die. And uh, Elijah said to her, 
He said, here's what you need to do. You'll make me a cake first. And if you'll give me a cake first, there will always be enough for you and your son and me until the Lord sends the rain. Now, I just have to tell you, it seems to me that the last thing I would want to do is take the last meal out of the mouth of a widow woman and her son. So it took a lot of faith. It took a lot of faith for her to be, for him to be able to say, make me a cake first. I would have been the guy that would have said, come on, let's go find some more food or let's go do something else. But he had to have faith that what he was asking her to do was going to work and God was going to bring the solution to this famine problem that they both had. It took a lot of faith for her to say, okay, man of God, I'll make you a cake first. And, and, and we'll just kind of trust the Lord that what you said is going to happen. Could I tell somebody right now that a Zarephath revival takes a lot of faith. Sometimes you got to kind of turn your head to the circumstances. Sometimes you can't look at what's really happening. You have to have faith to understand that I'm seeing with eyes of faith and not with the reality of what's happening around you. Come on, man of God. Keep preaching when you don't see anything happening. Keep believing when you don't see anything taking place. Preach to an empty chair if you have to because God's up to something and God's going to give revival in Zarephath if you have faith and trust Him for it. Praise God. Second thing I want, I want to say about a Zarephath revival is it takes sacrifice. We've already heard this. We've already heard this. It takes sacrifice. It doesn't just accidentally happen. Amen. We're going to have to do our part. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves and get busy. Uh, there's not going to be a FedEx or a, uh, or, or, uh, a delivery or your front door called revival. Uh, you're going to have to roll your sleeves up and get to work and teach those Bible studies uh, and, and, and do all the things that you can do. Because what I've learned is that when I do what I can do, God will do what I can't do. God will do what I'm not capable of doing. Praise God. Let me tell you something else about a Zarephath revival. Oil keeps flowing. Every time you tip up the cruise, oil comes out. And there's always meal in the barrel in a Zarephath revival. You may not understand it and you may not see it. You may not be able to explain it. But somehow you may have invited 57 people and not a one of them showed up. But somebody you never even talked to showed up. And they came to the altar and God filled it with the Holy Ghost. I'm just telling you. Oil flows. Meal barrels stay full. In a Zarephath revival. Come on. I wrote this down. I just thought I'd say it. Some churches are closing down and we're taking over their churches. It's a fact. People that can't get people to come to church and they're having to sell their buildings or give their buildings away. And God's putting us right in buildings we never built, uh, in places we never dreamed we would be, uh, in Zarephath in the middle of impossibilities, uh, places where we never thought we could own a piece of property. Uh, here we are uh, owning a piece of property. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, God can get revival in Zarephath. Uh, he can get revival in the most wicked, sinful, and godly place in the world. God. Maybe this is a good place. Finally, I, start, I forgot to start my clock. Okay. okay. Our theme is engage. We need to get engaged. Everybody needs to get engaged. That was the first day. Everybody needs to get engaged. Become a part of what God is doing. Don't sit back and wait on everybody else to do it. Become a part of it. Get engaged. Praise God. Your pastor... Your pastor's just waiting on you to get engaged in what's going on in the church. He's just waiting on you to show up and say, what can I do, pastor? I had somebody come to me just a few days ago and said, I want to be screened because I want to be a Sunday school teacher. And after I picked myself up off of the floor, I said, 
That was a little bit of an exaggeration. Get, in, get engaged. Everybody needs to be engaged. Invest. Today's theme was invest. We need to invest. We need to invest. Amen. Just put your money there. Put your time there. Put your energy there. Put your people there. Put ministers there. We need to be investing in the kingdom. If we're ever going to have a Zarephath revival, there's going to have to be an investment. Brother Longstress said it so well this morning. Sometimes when you first invest, it seems like a bad idea. If every church that we, every person we send out, we usually lose about 10% of our congregation. And I'm like, I'm not sure that was a good idea. But God always replaces them. And, and now there's more than just that 10%. Because God is multiplying. I'm just telling you, invest. Uh, invest in people. Uh, invest people. Uh, invest the finances. Uh, invest in the kingdom. God. Tomorrow we're going to talk about launch. We need to launch people. And I know I'm not the first one to say it, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to reiterate it. It's not just about letting them go. It's launching them. Putting them in a position where they can survive and win. Launching them. We need to launch. In the last day, we're going to talk about harvest. I'm telling you, there's a harvest in Oklahoma that we can't even imagine. I don't have time to read this, the articles to you, but if you've been watching uh, uh, news uh, resources and whatever, uh, people are moving to Oklahoma. The population is growing. Because we have some sins. <laughs> Strike that from the record. <laughs> because cost of living is lower. It's a great place to raise a family. There's a lot of beautiful things that are available in Oklahoma. There's a, 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 a vast... Uh, a very vast difference in terrain. And, and, and I know we're just all accustomed to it because we've lived here. Most of us have lived here most of our lives. But I'm just telling you, I believe it's not an accident that God is speaking to companies to bring their people here. That God is speaking to people to move to Oklahoma. You know why? Because he be I believe he believes there is a church in Oklahoma that is going to reach for the lost. And we're going to have a revival in Seraphath. The churches are going to grow. New churches are going to be started. You know why? Because God is not inhibited. He knows what he's doing. Come on, let's join hands with him. Praise God. Praise God. The third thing about a Zarephath revival... The third thing about a Zarephath revival that I think we need to pay attention to today is God used the most unlikely person to bring about this revival. If I'm doing it, I'm looking for a, looking for a politician that has influence. If I'm doing it, I'm looking for someone with a lot of resources so they can fund our operation. If I'm doing this, I'm looking for somebody who can play the piano and sing like nobody's business. If I'm going to have a revival, I'm looking for a building that will knock people's eyes out. But God said, I want you to get over there to Zarephath because I've got a widow woman that's going to sustain you. She may not look like much to anybody else, and she may not have a lot of ability. In fact, uh, all she's looking for is a couple of sticks so she can build a fire, uh, so she can make a, a, a meal for her and her son, and she's about to die. But you get over there, man of God, because I'm going to use that woman, and she's going to help you have a revival in this town. I came to tell somebody, don't overlook anybody in your church. Don't overlook anybody because God can use the most unlikely people in your church. Young people, come on. I know everybody overlooks you sometimes, but God can use you to bring a revival in your church. Children, I want you to know God can use you. Let's go. 
I gotta speak in code here, okay? We've been working on a, we've been working on somebody to come to our church for about 10 years. And you know what? We have had absolutely no success to get them to come to our church. We've tried everything we could think of. But this person's granddaughter started going to school with a little girl from our church. And just the other day, after 10 years of trying, a little, what grade? First grader brought grandma with her to VBS. What I couldn't do in 10 years, that little girl did. And grandma walked in and said, wow. Wow. I'm telling you, don't overlook anybody. That new convert that God's sending to you, he's got resources. Uh, he's got acquaintances. Uh, he's got an influence, a sphere of influence uh, that you don't even have any idea about. Uh, don't overlook anybody. Uh, if God could use a widow woman to bring a great revival uh, in the most unlikely place uh, with the most unlikely person, uh, God can use anybody in your church. Uh, he can use your young people. Uh, he can use your young marriage. Uh, he can use the elders in your church. Church. Uh, he can use the new converts in your church. Amen. One of the longest members of our church. We had a we had a get together recently. One of the longest members of our church said, "We're coming to this get together, and we're bringing someone with us." So I said, "Cool." So I sit down next to them and this person. We struck up this talk, conversation. We were talking and talking. And invited him to church. And he said, I like small churches and quiet churches. <laughs> and I'm like, we're really nice people. <laughs> The other morning I saw, looked out and I saw a person sitting there, tears rolling down the cheeks. It was somebody that's been in the church a long, long time, but God connected them. Could I tell every child of God in here, I don't care how long you've been in here, you've got influence. And you, I don't care how long you've been in here. You, don't leave it to the young people. Don't leave it to the new converts. You can make a difference. And bring somebody to sit beside you. They trust you. They've been watching you for a long time. Amen. Praise God. And it's not all the preacher's responsibility. I know you know that. But I'm just reminding you. New converts. Young people. Children. Amen. Let me tell you one more thing about a Zarephath revival. Dead things come to life. In a Zarephath revival. That widow woman's son died, and you know the story. You just read it right there. There's a. And she said, What's going on? And the scripture says, Scripture says that the man of God prayed, and that boy came back to life. And when he came back to life, I want you to notice something. The woman said unto Elijah, verse 24. Chapter, chapter 17. Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. I mean, why couldn't she believe that there was oil in the cruise and, and there was meal in the barrel uh, for all of this time but that didn't convince her it wasn't until she saw her son come back to life uh, that she realized uh, this man is a man of God could I just tell you we need the supernatural uh, in our churches uh, we need the power of the Holy Ghost to bring dead things to life uh, we need powerful demonstrations uh, of the Spirit of God in our church services. You know why? Because that'll do what nothing else will do. That'll bring people to a realization that this
this is where I need to be. I know this man is a man of God. And I know the word in his mouth is the word of God. Come on, somebody. We need to have revival services. We need to have the power of God moving in every service. We need people to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We need people to be healed in their bodies. We need God to show up and be large and in charge. Because that's going to make the revival in Zarephath. Reality. Praise God. Praise God. I'm almost finished. Praise God. Two more points, okay? They're kind of long, so don't get excited. We love, we love Matthew chapter 16, don't we? Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi. And he said to his disciples, who, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? They said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist and some Elias and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Of course, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, not revealed unto thee by my Father, which is in heaven. I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, upon this rock, this revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we preach about that often, but I want to give you a little context, if I may. So, Jesus took them. To Caesarea Philippi. This is not Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea. This is Caesarea Philippi in the extreme northern part. North of Israel. It's near the foot of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon. It was a city that was dominated by immoral, immoral activities and pagan worship. Only 25 miles to the south of Caesarea Philippi were the religious communities of Galilee. Jesus could have given this message anywhere he wanted. But he chose to take his disciples 25 miles north of Galilee. To a city that was rebuilt by one of the Herods. And so it was renamed at that point Caesarea Philippi after, after the... The Herod. This city was given to idolatry. It was, it was given to the god, the Greek god, Pan. Pan. When the Romans conquered the territory, Herod Philip rebuilt the city, named it after himself. In this city, there is a cliff. I've been there. There's a cliff with a cave opening below the cliff. And there are, there's a spring of water that flows out of that. To the pagan mind, this cave at Caesarea Philippi created a gateway to the underworld. This was where they believed that fertility gods lived during the winter time. Caesarea Philippi's location was especially unique because... It stood at the base of this cliff and the water ran directly from the mouth of the cave. They saw water as a symbol of the underworld and thought their gods traveled to and fro from the underworld through this cave. To the pagan mind, Caesarea Philippi, this cave was the gate to the underworld. They believed their city was literally at the gates of hell. And so Jesus takes his disciples to this location intentionally. And he's giving them a little graduation, you know, attaboy at the end almost. And he says, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Well, you're, I read it to you. But who do you say that I am? And Jesus said, upon this rock, this revelation, I will build my church. 
Even this place. Even the God pan. Even this place cannot stop what I am about to do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many people believe in pan. It doesn't matter how many uh, uh, immoral activities are going on around here. It doesn't matter what people are doing at the mouth of this cave. It doesn't matter uh, how they view the water coming out of it. Uh, I'm still going to have a church. Uh, I'm still going to build a church. Uh, and nothing uh, is ever going to stop it. Uh, I came to remind somebody... Uh, God's got a church in Oklahoma that's bigger than we can imagine. He's got a church in Oklahoma that is stronger than we can even think about. Upon this revelation, God's going to build his church and even the gates of hell shall not prevail. Praise God, musicians can come. If God could put church in Caesar's household, Philippians 4 and 22, surely he can build a church. Stand with me if you would. Surely he can build a church in Oklahoma. Peter said there's a church in Babylon. He could put a church in Babylon. Surely he could put a church in Oklahoma. I'm telling you, there's a revival in Oklahoma. The picture I put up was Zarephath, but I put Oklahoma because that's where I believe the revival is that God has for us. It's right here in our backyard. Praise God. We don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to go anywhere else. It doesn't matter. If, it doesn't matter if Jezebel's daddy is in charge of this area. It doesn't matter if Jezebel shows up every so often. God knows how to build a church, right? In Zarephath. Praise God. There's one more time I find in Scripture where Tyre and Sidon are mentioned together. Ezra chapter 3. Verse number seven. They're building the temple. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters. And meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon. And to them of Tyre. To bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Java. According to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. Eventually, eventually, those from Tyre and Sidon are mentioned as helping, helping rebuild the temple in Ezra's day. I'm just going to tell you something, folks. Those people that's going to be a part of that revival in Zarephath, Tyre and Sidon, they're going to help you build that church. They're going to help you build that temple. They're going to be helping you build that temple. They're going to be your Sunday school teachers. They're going to be your youth leaders. They're going to be your worship leaders. Hallelujah. I hate to even say it. Just pretend like I'm not saying it. We were needing a drummer one time. You know what? God sent us a drummer from Nashville. Brother Alba, where are you? You prophesied that God's going to send us a drummer. You're going to, he's going to send us, he's going to send us a bunch of people. And he gave some details and it's happened. We need a guitar player right there. He is. Hold your hand. Up. One of the best guitar players you'll ever hear in your life. Right there he is. 
He got the Holy Ghost easier than anybody I've ever seen in my life. He walked up. I was dismissing on a Wednesday night service, and he walked up. Brother Jones brought him up, and he said, he wants the Holy Ghost. I said, you want the Holy Ghost? He said, yeah, I want the Holy Ghost. I said, I want you to lift your hands, and I was going into a Bible study with him. I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to start worshiping the Lord. And before I could even get it out, he lifted his hand and started talking in tongues. <laughs> good guitar player and I'm like are you sure you know how that goes pastor right are you sure we didn't have an we didn't have an audition but I was sure nervous brother Kevin he showed up and after the first practice I said we need to practice you need to come to practice and after practice I said to my daughter I said how did he do is he a, is he can he play the guitar she said oh yeah <laughs> I'm telling you, God's got a revival in Zarephath. Oklahoma hasn't seen yet what God's got in store for us. I just need a man of God. I just need a pastor. I just need some people to believe that God's at large and in charge. And he's given revival in the most unlikely places. Through the most unlikely people. Uh, it's going to take some sacrifice. Uh, it's going to take some investment. Uh, it's going to take some challenges. Uh, but I believe God uh, is going to pour out His Spirit all over this state. Uh, and there's going to be 129 churches. Uh, and then there's going to be 139 churches. Uh, and then there's going to be 149 churches. Uh, we can have a whole lot more churches across Oklahoma because God is in the business uh, of walking into the most difficult situations uh, and giving revival. It's going to take some sacrifice, Pastor. I know you think I, I can't even hardly do what I'm doing now, but I'm telling you, Brother Barron said it today. He said, God will just make it up. I promise he'll make it up. And I stand here. I was so, I'm sorry, Brother Wyatt, I am. I was so moved when I was at your church just a few weeks ago on that Sunday morning. They were celebrating all the different churches that are, have come out of that church and the people that were reaching out. And, and as they were celebrating, it was their 15th anniversary. And as they were celebrating that, I was like, my, 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 look what God is doing. I'm telling somebody here. You can step out and you can do it again. You can duplicate yourself. Come on. I know it's going to leave a hole when that person leaves your church. But take it from somebody, some people who have done it before. God will always put them back. He'll always replace them. And he'll even replace them with a few extras along the way. Push down, shaking together, running over. I'm inviting every pastor right now that would to come up here and stand across the front of this uh, this uh, altar right now. Uh, we're going to pray for our pastors uh, that God would strengthen them, uh, that God would anoint them, uh, that God would give them a vision like they've never had before. Uh, there are cities in your section uh, that need a church. Uh, there are towns in our, our state uh, that need multiple churches. Uh, there are metropolitan cities and neighborhoods uh, that need more churches. Churches, uh, we've got it. Uh, God can give us revival in Zarephath. Uh, now I want the saints of God to come along behind the pastors. Uh, and I want you to start praying for them. 